Spoilers! Spoilers! Oh yeah, some Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. Spoiler talk, and of course you knew this was coming. Since I've been talking about Harry Potter over the past three and a half months, and I did my review of Fantastic Beasts, and I thank you all for watching that. I admit, I'm pretty proud of that review. So now that the movie's been out for a weekend, let's talk some spoilers! And in case you haven't figured it out already, that is a big fat spoiler warning for Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. If you have not found said beast, then this is your last chance to turn away, otherwise this movie is gonna be ruined for you, unless you just don't care, in which case, yeah, go ahead, keep watching. Feel like I'm forgetting something though. Bum bum ba da 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 Yes, for every video I make about Fantastic Beasts and where to find them, I mess up my hair like this because that main character, New Scamander, still won't brush that damn full head of hair of his. So as long as he won't do it, then I will continue to not give a shit. So without further ado, let's talk some spoilers about the movie! This is New Scamander's wand. Isn't it cool? So the movie starts off, of course, you know, with the Warner Brothers logo going right through the clouds and you, you know, it's all familiar. You see the title of the movie in the clouds just like Harry Potter was and when I saw it for the first time, there was applause, which you're gonna hear in the audience reaction video. And as if that wasn't enough to drive the familiarity home, right after the title, we get these newspaper transitions that is right out of the later Harry Potter films. And right off the bat, we're starting off with Grindelwald. These newspaper headlines, they're all about Gellert Grindelwald. He's a dark wizard. He's out there doing attacks in Europe. You even see him, the first shot in the movie, I think, or the second shot in the movie is the back of his his head is all blonde. And I think like the week before this film came out, there were rumors going around on the internet that, hmm, maybe Johnny Depp's playing Grindelwald. Boy, I wish I hadn't heard those rumors. Because right when I saw the back of his head, I was like, that looks like Johnny Depp's head. I don't know how I'd be able to recognize the back of his head, but right when I saw it, I was like, that's Johnny Depp. But anyways, we find Newt in New York. He's going about his business. He bumps into Jacob Kowalski out on the street and they do the classic bit with the suitcase. You know, they have matching suitcases. It's done in many comedies and, you know, TV shows, whatever before. But like, oh, they have the same suitcase, so they're gonna mix it up and that's how this whole thing is gonna start. It's a really easy way to write it, but they did actually kill two birds with one stone here. We got Jacob involved and we started this whole catastrophe of the beast getting loose. And Jacob Kowalski is hilarious in this movie. He had the most laughs from the audience, of course, in this film. Like when he's at the bank and he's trying to get that loan for his bakery, the guy guy there is all like, what do you have to offer the bank as collateral? And Jacob has a suitcase, he's all like, what about my pastries? That was a pretty big laugh. But right in that scene, you get the feels for him. He's trying to do what he's always wanted to do. He wants to cook, he wants to run his own bakery, and he doesn't get the loan. You're like, oh, I'm sorry about that, man. You, you, you sympathize with him. So right off the bat, you feel a connection with Jacob because you're like, oh man, I feel sorry for you. I care about this character now. And then he gets caught up in Newt's whole adventure. I gotta say though that Queenie is still probably my favorite character. You learn right when you meet her that she can read people's minds. She's what wizards call a legilimens. Which is funny, right when Newt said, oh, you're a legilimens, it reminded me of that scene from Order of the Phoenix, where Snape was teaching Occlumency to Harry Potter and he uses a spell he says legitimates and that spell allowed him to look into his mind So I was like, oh, so are there wizards that are just naturally able to read people's minds like telepaths like Professor X and shit? I think it's pretty cool that there are certain types of wizards and witches that can excel at certain skills I guess Queenie Goldstein here was just born with the natural gift of being a telepath And actually I didn't even realize this until my roommate pointed it out to me Alison Sudol who plays Queenie. She's actually known as a fine frenzy. She's a musician I was like, holy crap almost lover. I know that song Wow, that's her? Man, it's just a thing that happened with me. But the big thing this movie really more or less centers around is this entity called an Obscurus, which you learn is this sort of magical dark force that is created by young wizards who were just forced into hiding. I guess sometime before this movie happened, there was a time where muggles were actually hunting down wizards, and some of the young wizards were so pent up with rage and anger that they actually had this dark force inside them, and literally became this shroud of black mass that would just destroy everything, and that's called an Obscurus. Which I think that's actually pretty cool, I'm like, wow, Wow, that's a cool metaphor for anger. I like it. I like it when movies can actually have this cool metaphor for anger like the Hulk. That's pretty much the classic one. One of the things I noticed in this movie is where Newt and Tina, they're all being brought in for trial over at Makuza. Newt comes out of his suitcase and you hear one of the guys go, is that Scamander the war hero? And another guy replies, no, this is his younger brother. I was like, whoa, wait a minute, what is this? So I looked it up and apparently Newt has an older brother named Theseus. I think he was like an Auror or something, I don't quite remember. But I had to think that since he was mentioned, we're probably gonna see him later on in this film series. Which is actually something I really like about this film. This film plants seeds for things that are gonna happen later on in the film series, much like Force Awakens did. Like there was one scene in this film, you see Zoe Kravitz in a picture frame. I'm like, wow, what's Zoe Kravitz doing there? And then Newt and Queenie start talking about, oh, she was Lita 
strange, you know, they were close friends back when they were at Hogwarts. And the way they were talking about her in the past and maybe some big tragedy happened, I was like, oh, maybe Lita's dead. But then at the end of the movie, you had that conversation where Tina and Newt were talking and the Tina was like, what does Lita like to do these days? I was like, okay, maybe Lita's not dead. And of course, the fact that her last name was Lestrange, that instantly got me excited because Bellatrix is one of my favorite characters in all of Harry Potter. So there that is. Of course, one of the biggest Easter egg reference tie-ins in this film was the appearance of this symbol right here. Colin Farrell's walking around as Percival Grays, but not really Percival Grays. He's carrying around this Deathly Hallows necklace. Right when I saw it, I was like, wow. What? I mean, what's that doing in this film? What is- is this gonna tie in with Deathly Hallows somehow? What the hell? Why does Percival Graves have a Deathly Hallows necklace? What is- what it- what is this? You find out later, of course, but I'll get there in a minute. You find out that this big obscurus that has been attacking New York is- is- that's pretty much the other story here. This movie is basically two stories that are taking place simultaneously. There's the beasts that are loose and now we gotta go wrangle them up. All the while, there's this other story about this obscurus that's been attacking New York City and Makuza's trying to track down who did it. You find out that the obscurus that's been attacking New York City is none other than Credence, Ezra Miller's character. And this dude is intense. He was great in this film. Cause all the while in this film, you see him, he's like bowing his head, he's kind of looking like this, he's really nervous, he's twitching, he's crying in the corner. You learn that he's been beaten by his stepmother. Not an easy life, so you can understand why he would have an Obscurus. I guess he's the first Obscurus to live past age 10. In any case, after that whole showdown, they're down in the train station, they're on the tracks, and everyone's there, you got Newt, Tina, Percival Graves is there, and all the ores come in from Makuza, and they start blasting at him, and then he dies. Although maybe he doesn't really die, because there's that one last shred of Obscurus that kind of slurs away at the end. And then you have the big shocker of the film. This is it. Here we are. Percival Graves starts giving his monologue. He's like, yeah, who does this law protect? Us? or them, the no matches up there. I've had enough of you guys, I've refused to bow down any longer. So Makuza's all like, all right, we're just gonna take this guy down. And he's deflecting spells, and then Nuke gets him with that swooping evil, he binds him. Tina gets his wand, and then Nuke goes, Revelio. I can't wait for you to hear my reaction to this. Right when his hair started turning blonde, I was like, oh my god. It slowly pans over, and then you see it. It's Grindelwald, played by Johnny Depp, and he's got the mustache and everything. I mean, the audience was going nuts. It was awesome. Again, I wish I didn't know about these rumors, that, like, a week before the movie came out, that Johnny Depp might be Grindelwald, because it would have been just a huge surprise. But it was pretty awesome, nonetheless. And he has a couple of lines, right when he's kneeling down, he's like, Do you think you can hold me? And then one more line when he looks at Newt, and he's all like, Will we die? Just a little? I'll admit, I'm still not sure what that line means. Like, what does he mean by that? I don't know, but in any case, that was an awesome scene. So it turns out after this whole big throwdown, you know, the city's been torn, mankind has seen wizards, they're exposed, but Newt has his Thunderbird and he has the vial that he gives to the Thunderbird, so he flies up and now the whole city is gonna be obliviated by the rain, which is pretty convenient, admittedly. I'll admit though, that Jacob goodbye scene was pretty emotional. They have to say goodbye at the subway entrance. Jacob's all like, Newt, why did you keep me around? Newt's all like, Cause I like you, cause you're my friend. And then you see Jacob go, oh! I'm like, god damn it! It's emotional, they have to say goodbye forever, or do they? At least Jacob got his bakery though, that was really cool to see, and all his pastries look like the creatures. You see the Niffler, you see the Demi guys, and then the last scene of the movie is the last guest that enters into the bakery is Queenie. It's just this silent moment, they look into each other's eyes, and then Jacob's like, Hmm, you look familiar or something, and then cut to black. Okay, it's one of those endings. I mean, he's totally gonna remember who she is. I guess the Obliviate spell just doesn't work all that well, or maybe it just doesn't work when it's important to the story. I don't know how the Obliviate spell works, maybe I forgot. Point is, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them was a really cool movie. It was a welcome return to J.K. Rowling's Wizarding World. I love the hell out of it. I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes. I'm looking forward to hearing what the next movie's gonna be called. I don't think it's gonna be called Fantastic Beasts because if we went after the beast once, I don't think we're gonna do that again. We might still follow the story of Newt and Tina and the gang. I mean, we're definitely gonna see Jacob and Queenie again because we gotta know what happens for the rest of that scene. I'm really looking forward to seeing how Johnny Depp delivers his Gellert Grindelwald. That I'm really looking forward to. It's gonna be awesome in the next movie. I'm looking forward to seeing who they cast as young Dumbledore. Just, it's gonna be a really entertaining next decade of films from J.K. Rowling's Wizarding World. So for the question, I'm gonna get specific here. What is your favorite part of Fantastic Beasts and where to find them? And what is your least favorite part? Whatever they are, go ahead and leave a comment. And... Don't forget to subscribe.